Welcome to Open Talk, and I want to jump right in and thank uh, Liam Sharp for joining us today. He is a corporate editorial advertising and portrait photographer. Uh, I've known him for quite a while, and it is very exciting to have him on the show today and uh, discuss his uh, background in photography and lots of stories I know what we're going to have today. Liam, how are you today? I'm good. Good. Well, well thanks for joining us. First and foremost, where, where are you? Since we can't be in the same place, where are you? A good question. I mean, I just came out of, I'm in Toronto. Um, I, we came up to see our daughter, drove up uh, two weeks ago, and we've just come out of quarantine. So I've been able to uh, go outside the garage. What was the border cro crossing like, and what, how, how has it been different from the, you know, the States to going into Canada, the whole uh, atmosphere of COVID and, and uh, the way they're dealing with it, and looking back you know, towards the United States from uh, you know, another country? Right. I mean, it's, um, it was just bizarre going through the border because, you yeah. know, I mean, uh, Peace Bridge and there was probably, a th I think, 25 different lanes and we were the only car going through the border. So it was uh, kind of interesting. I mean, to be honest, I mean, the quarantine, the way the quarantine works, you just literally are not allowed to stop. You have to drive straight to where you're going to quarantine. And so I've just literally gone out and got a burger <laughs> for the first time for a oh, the last two weeks so um oh yeah i mean it's it's uh, but you know i mean it's it's you know what's really interesting is that from my perspective is that you know like you we we kind of lived through the pandemic and the lockdown in new york and you know as we we took precautions you know but it just i mean it just as long as we you know wore a mask and all that kind of stuff it was it seemed fine fine and we just slowly kind of uh, allowed ourselves more and more freedom as as things got better you know, the, the perspective from here, of course, is that the news is like, you know, the whole United States is, you know, being completely infected with, you know, that's it's out of control. It's all those. It, it, it is out of control. <laughs> it is. Out of I mean, that's control. not, that's, that's sort of not an exaggeration. <laughs> yeah, but we lived through it. You know, we, we were there too, you know, and it was out of control. But, but it, if you look at the numbers, it's higher now than it, it's ever been. That's, that's true. And, and, and it only keeps going up and the rate of infection every day is, is higher and we're hitting 50, 60, now 70,000 a day. It's just, it, 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 yeah, it's not being handled right. well. And, and I would assume in Canada, are they taking it seriously? Do you, are they wearing masks everywhere? Is it, is it no. an issue up there at all? It's, just, it's, just, it's a no. totally different environment, right? It's a totally different environment. I mean, yeah. there, you know, my brother lives in Newfoundland and there's no, there was one case recently of somebody oh. from New York and he was in quarantine. And so, I mean, they haven't had, COVID and my my son lives in the, in, the, in the Yukon and they haven't had I think they had three cases initially in March and that's it so a lot of these provinces are completely closing down so I you know I can't go or anybody can't go um, pretty well outside I mean I can go to Quebec I can go to the next but, but yeah so and is your plan to stay there for a while is there any are there any trips upcoming uh, uh, I mean other than I'm going to go uh, next week we rented a cottage going to go to up north again you know to be nice there and all that kind of stuff, but uh, just as a kind of a contrast to how we've been living in New York in the last few months. <laughs> but, you know, I want, no, I want to come back to New York. I mean, we came up, uh, we were camping, and my wife says, well, we're two-thirds towards Canada. Let's just keep driving. And I didn't even <laughs> think I was going to be here. <laughs> you know, my daughter's here, right? So Oh, um, that's nice. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it, it, I think it's uh, I've seen a lot of people getting some wonderful family time in. We have to look at the, the brighter sides. You know, it's not, no. I think the problem is we t always looked at what we've lost and we don't look at what we still have. So I think it's important to really look at what we still have. All right. So uh, let's dive in from the beginning. Uh, where were you born? In England, London, London, England. England. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and your parents, what did they do? My dad was a photographer, actually. Is that right? And, yeah. And he so was it's, in the, it's in the blood. It's totally in the blood because my daughter's a photographer and I found out recently one of the first uh, female photographers in Britain was a relative of mine. I mean, my, my uncle was a photographer, my son's a photographer, my daughter's a photographer. I mean, it's... Wow. Uh, yeah, my dad was actually quite an interesting photographer because he did he did a, one iconic image which was sort of made that everybody knows. So if you Google John Lennon and, and Yoko Ono and, and Ivor Sharp was his name, uh, he took this iconic image in the bed in in Montreal. That was well, the bed in image. Yeah, 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 the bed in image. And um, but his studio was the. Um, uh, it was a blow up studio in London and it was used for the film. So he's had the, this being this sort of uh, history in that way uh, in the, you know, and I actually had to fight to sort of get, get an opportunity to borrow his camera when I was a kid. And because my brother was older than me and he said, okay, I'll give you one roll of film to prove uh, 
that you, you know, it's worthwhile me lending you my camera and encouraging you. And so I had this one roll of film to kind of prove. So in, uh, in the total it. opposite side, it, was it um, something that was uh, daunting and stressful and, and, you know, you had to live up to other people's expectations early on as a photographer, or did you felt supported and freedom uh, at, because everybody was in the family doing photography? You know, it's, it, it's interesting you say that because I think my daughter faces, has faced the same sort of thing. And that is that the, you know, it's one thing when, you know, obviously growing up and having a dark room and having equipment and having somebody kind of nurture you and just being around the business side of things and learning about that. It's great. But once I actually started being a photographer, I would be going out to seeing art directors and I felt like I was my dad's rep. Because every time they see me, they said, oh, you know, you're I have a sharp son. I've, actually, I've got this job. Let me call him, you know, and it's, and uh, so I, you know, it's interesting you say that because it really uh, shaped the direction of my career right from the start. And what, what I found was, is that initially, uh, when I went into photography as a, as a professional, I decided that I had to do something completely different than my dad. And so what I did was, is I start, I, I did this uh, industrial photography. I, I kind of uh, went in that direction because that wasn't, anything to do with my father and I yeah. find my own clients and build my own business. Oddly enough, um, it was in the eighties and I was able to build a, a very strong business uh, right off well, the we're, bat. We're going to get to that, but we're, yeah. we're still, we're still on little Liam right now. So we're, oh, okay. you're growing up in England and uh, uh, your formidable years in elementary and, and high school. Is, is that where you're still at? Well, we, we left, we left when I was seven. So, um, Oh, wow. So, and then we went to Montreal and we were sort mm -hmm. of one of the far, lost sort of boats, you know, the immigrants getting off the boat in Montreal. And so, um, and then we were there for about 10 years until the whole Quebec um, uh, crisis, or I wouldn't say crisis, but where, where basically they brought in new laws where uh, you had to speak French to work. And so French became the official language of Quebec. And, and so my parents moved to Toronto at that point. So. Right. Um, so you've already been jumping around a lot. Is that uh, is that tough with you know the friendships and 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 the upbringing? And are you finding your cliques in high school, or is it uh, you're you're just moving around a lot? Yeah, but you know, ten years uh, in one it's a solid amount of time. But it's a solid amount of time, and then it I also had, makes it harder to leave. I didn't want to leave. No, as yeah. a kid, I mean, we had a great lifestyle because you know Montreal was near all the ski hills, and so the whole I was really into skiing and you know playing hockey on the street, you know the street, you know all that sort of stuff, right? Baseball, and so I mean, you know, I had a pretty decent life that way, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, early on we got motorcycles, and we were you know lived near the, you know, uh, you know this kind of the the outer reaches of Montreal, so we'd find our way along the you know the hydro lines into the into in Montreal on our bikes and you know so we had kind of a kind of a fun kind of upbringing that way and then you know I guess the harder part was when we went to Toronto because I went when I was in grade 10 and you know and uh, yeah that was more difficult so for your high school years are you in one place throughout throughout for all of high school uh pretty well I mean the Montreal system you have a junior and senior high so we kind of kind of transferred at the senior high uh point uh, into yeah. uh which was sort of more into um, I guess further along into into high school in, in, in Toronto. And are are you a good student, or are you, are you just not not you know, kind of clicking in school, terrible, or terrible student? <laughs> I was a terrible student. I, you know, I, it's interesting you say. You know, it's really because uh, I was lear completely learning disabled. I still am completely learning disabled. And uh, you know, when I was growing up, they didn't have um, my daughter is. And they, I, they I have to tell you something. You, you're going to say dyslexic, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. You're, you're, I think uh, of all my open talk interviews, I think you're maybe my fourth or fifth one now that is dyslexic, uh, including myself. And I've had this, you know, in, in past open talks, uh, how in, it makes sense. You know, it, it, Einstein, Da Vinci, Rockefeller, Edison, all dyslexic, uh, right. they're extremely uh, artistic. And what I've explained in many other episodes is for us, it's the simplest thing as of reading. You right. look at a, a book, it must've been reading was tough for you, no? It was absolutely. Yeah. So what today, happens? I, I what, listen to books. What happens is, and that's that's what we have to do. What happens is, is we the average person roughly wants to take in uh, maybe ten to fifteen things, items like visually a second, right. and reading they can actually go across and start at the first line, go across and read. When a dyslexic looks at it, we want to take in that whole page as a picture, all the symbols, all the letters. So to actually go back and focus on the first letter 
to the word and then followed across the line, by the time we've gotten across, we've a, either forgotten what we've read or wanted to you know, take in other things. And it's, it's become so frustrating. It is so hard to focus because we want to take in maybe 25 to 100 things per second. Right. So we are memorizing the shape of the page, how it looks, the texture. I mean, it is, is that what you found? Yeah, I couldn't concentrate. I mean, I yeah. couldn't, and it was the same sort of thing. I couldn't read through a sentence. Without- and they force us to learn by the way they expect everybody else to learn. And when I was uh, in school, they would like, no, you have to take notes. You have to do this. And I would like be writing notes and I'd forget everything else they said. And I was terrible. They said I was lazy. They said, I, you, know, you know, he's very smart, but he's just lazy. And that wasn't the case. Once I said, if you just let me listen, and that's what happened. I started able to listen. They found out I was dyslexic. And, you know, right. it's like we just learned right. differently. Right. And it's a, and I think the reason you're, you know, artistic has a lot to do with dyslexia. And I, it's, a, it's we wouldn't be the people we were if it wasn't for it. I agree. So I agree. at that point, uh, who are your friends? What are your influences there? Are, are you a movie person? Is it all about music? Is it just going around outside and, and, and playing out in the, the, you know, the, the grand, you know, landscape? What, what kind of kid are you at this point? Where, in high school? Yeah. Uh, in high school. I mean, I would, I, I, acting, theater. I mean, I was, uh, uh, you know, that was one thing that I could do, even though, I guess, as you say, learning scripts and stuff like that, but just being able to, you know, exp- express myself and, yeah. and kind of, I really got into that. So for me, it was like this, I, you know, am I going to be an actor or am I going to be a photographer? I'm going to be an actor, you know, and then with the whole thing with, I guess, you know, my father being a photographer and do I really want to do that? And um, so already in high school, you're having this debate of what you want to be and, and you're, you're playing with two things, an actor and photography at that point. Well, the problem was I was a better photographer. <laughs> That's the truth. I mean, I wasn't, I mean, as much as I enjoyed the acting, uh, I was a better photographer. And, yeah. and, you know, and, I, and I remember this one time at the end of high school, I went to this one professional audition and I, and I couldn't believe it. You know, there was like a hundred people coming in, you know, and you're waiting and then you go and you have like three minutes next, you know, and it was just like, okay, I'm not going to be able to make a living doing this. Okay. <laughs> I get that, you know. And uh, by that time, I was working, um, my dad actually introduced me to Jay Maisel. And so I was Jay Maisel's assistant in Canada. And I so, was- so already uh, as a high school student, you're working. What was, do you remember your, your first, like the first camera you actually owned in your first job? Well, I remember the first job. I mean, I, and I, and remember the first, uh, I, I used to work in Kmart, camera store as a teenager and yep. um, and uh, so uh, so i bought uh, a cat was it pentac sp 1000 or the k1000 i think it was sp 1000 and then the k1000 afterwards so um and i loved it because it was manual and you know i mean it was it was just the feel of it and and you know and so that's yeah that that was just my first camera really so and my dad had this really he had that system too along with others and he had this amazing 15 millimeter lens that that which is kind of not a good w- place to start because if we're <laughs> starting with a 50 mil lens, we should be starting with a normal lens. But anyways, it was, uh, um, yeah. So, so, and, and as far as first job, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, there was a first job that we were going to talk about, which was, uh, I was working as an assistant. So I, I, so what I did when I, I guess when I, uh, I, I left high school and all my friends were going to university and, uh, you know, they're all, they're, they all had this ability. And I, and I, um, you know, so if you had to, if you had to go like it, it, the, the classic movie, what, what click were you a part of in high school? Well, it was interesting that you say that because, um, you know, you know, you turned up at the, the, the high school initially. And of course there were the, you know, the jock characters and the, you know, yep. the, you know, that whole clicky thing. And then of yeah. course I, I, I wasn't part of that. And, um, and I remember sort of, um, being gravitated at that time there was uh you know people of color were were all in one group and so i just started hanging out with them you know i kind of you know because they were more interesting and it was it was and i you know i certainly wasn't part you know and they were welcoming and so on and so forth so i was uh i was with them and then but the other group i guess i was it was really funny one time um i was uh I remember I was part of this whole theater group, but you know, theater stuff. And I remember I was just, I just wanted to rebel on my way of rebelling. It's one time in high school, you can imagine all these jock characters and all those kinds of football players. I decided I was going to come in and wear my, you know, my dance leotards to school one day. And, and <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, I mean, but uh, so that, that was, uh, how did that go uh, over? That, that was, <laughs> so I, I was very much, you know, this, I, I'm going to define who I am and not, not be part of something. Yeah. Yeah. So you're in high school and you're, you're, 
what is you're coming to the end of graduation you're 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 working already cool what is what's next for you well um so what happened was is i was you know for the last three or four years before high school i would work with my dad uh as, as his assistant so and in the summertime he used to do these amazing jobs um and, and and these jobs he's mainly working on are what type of jobs? Well, they're like travel jobs. Uh, so at one point we went to Australia, you know, we went all over the world. And, and so uh, we used to do CP hotels, you know, and so we travel across the country. So yep. we would do, he was a kind of a, like an A-list advertising photographer. And so he would do these big shoots. So I was, I sort of had this experience as an assistant and Coming out of high school, I knew that I could, didn't want to go to university. I didn't want to go to college. And I sort of you knew I wanted to be a photographer. And so there was, um, he was doing this campaign for Air Canada in Europe. And mm -hmm. the art director was over uh, working with us uh, from Europe. And this is already after everybody started university. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And she basically said, look, why don't you come to London? I have, a, I have an extra room room and uh, I work with all the top photographers in London and I'll introduce you and that's what I did so I couldn't but it was funny because at the same time I had this opportunity with Jay Maisel he had asked me if I would come to New York and and possibly work with him and uh, and um, but you know uh, so I went through New York and I sort of hummed and hawed whether or not I should do this but of course I'm, I wasn't I didn't have any papers or legal and all that stuff and I was a British citizen so I, I, I kind of went to London did that but um, I had an incredible time in London I mean I, I got a job uh, within three days I had two job offers within three days I work with some of the best people uh, uh, you know of the day uh, I called uh, Brian Duffy he did the sort of the zigzag you know Bay yeah. Bay. Um, and then I also worked with another guy called Michael Joseph and uh, and he did the beggars banquet Rolling Stones so oh, we wow. would work we would yeah. work on these massive, he was known for these huge shoots for, you know, Smirnoff Vodka, whether it be. You know. So let's, let's rewind just a little bit. So you've left, you've left uh, high school and the very first thing you did is to work with your dad. Well, no, I was working with my dad while I was in high school. Right. So and then right after you left uh, high school, you were. I got this opportunity to go to London and I worked there for a couple of years working with three different photographers full time and uh, actually four. And, um, and two of them were unbelievable, like incredible. And uh, I learned to, to, to the two different photographers. One was Duffy, and he taught me one thing that 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 because I asked him, "How do you know how to light?" And he and, and that was one thing he said. And that's one thing we're going to discuss more in in you bring up right away early, and and light is very important in your photography. And I see the way right. you play with light. So at this point, have you really with your father? already have an understanding of light and playing with uh, you know, natural and artificial light. So where are you at this point in your career of really kind of understanding light and playing with it yourself? Well, I mean, at, at that point, I mean, I was working with my dad. And so you really, you, you're young. I mean, I was, uh, this is before I, I, I left to go to England, I was 19. And so even though I was just trying to be a good assistant and, you know, and I guess there was a lot of osmosis, but that was kind of like the, the job of the day was to be the good assistant, but it wasn't really until, I mean, obviously I knew how my dad did things, but it was sort of with me all my life. And it was yeah. really the opportunity to see how other photographers work that, that really started to put it together for me. But there was that one, two things that man, you know, two, th the one instrumental thing was that one thing that Duffy said to me and I, he, he said, he said to me, uh, I said, how do you, how do you know how to light? Cause this guy was absolutely brilliant. I mean, yeah. he was humble. He was brilliant. And, and he, he said to me, he says, well, it's all around you. All you have to do is study. And I, and I suddenly, and I, so what I did, because I knew nobody in London, everywhere I went, I started to study light, you know, you know, why is that light, you know, hitting the ceiling that way? Why is it falling off that way? Why is it, you know, what? And so I started to understand the physic, the physical aspect yeah. of light. And because I did that, kind of constantly by the end of it i really had an i you know a real clear idea about what it was as a tangible thing and and that kind of helped me because uh, we'll talk about it in a minute but it i came up with a lighting style right off the bat for the corporate photography and a technique that nobody else was doing that i i managed to see something by that sort of observation that set me up for my early career um, but the second thing was working with 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 Joseph because Joseph um, he had three assistants. There was the first assistant. I wasn't that. I mean, that's the guy who handled all the camera stuff. But I was the second assistant. And the second assistant was the lighting guy. So I was basically his lighting assistant. So we would go to the set after each shoot, and 
you know, he had Aston Martin, you know, with the flowing, you know, he was a classic, <laughs> you know, London photographer. And, you know, we would go and he would go, okay, we're going to, you know, strip, 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 bounce this, you know, and he would, I quickly draw a diagram. And this guy would show up 15 minutes before the shoot in his Aston Martin, you know, with a thing. And it was up to me, basically, to basically put the lighting kit together and to completely light these massive shoot so within a very short period of time i had a very good understanding about wow. how to light you know uh, and, yeah. and 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 there were certain techniques that were happening in london that weren't happening certainly in canada i don't yeah. know about new york and and so i was able to come back to 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 to, to Toronto at that point with a really solid base of yeah. understanding. It's funny you bring up the, the lighting thing. Is it, it, Early on, it happened for me because I, I was going off and I wanted to be a, a filmmaker. And I was going to NYU, going off to NYU Film School, Tisch School of the Arts. Uh, my mother was film commissioner at the time. So I, I sort of had that similar upbringing of like, you know, a parent that was in the industry and everybody going like, oh, you're so-and-so's son. You know, it's right. like, and, and you want to kind of break off and be a rebel, rebel and, and do things on your own terms. And it's tough. But uh, I remember sitting at a dinner. This came up last week. Uh, on, on the show with the Samantha Isom who uh, actually shot John Waters and I'm like oh I had a dinner and I was sitting next to John Waters and I was ready to go off to film school and I, and I looked at him I said what advice do you have for you know a guy going into film school their first year you know what should I study or what should I do and I'm expecting him to you know talk about all the different things he says study study the painters study the greats study Caravaggio study how he studied light and the way it fell upon things and that was like for me was an eye-opening kind of awakening thing and I want to roll back. So you are now, you've left your, your, your father, uh, who you've worked for, and, and sort of been under that house in photography, and now you're working with other people. You get to London. What's your first flat? You're, you're away from the family. You know, it, are you kind of living it up and going to pubs and, and kind of embracing this world of photography? Or are you just working so hard? Or like, what is that first couple of years right there? It was really tough, to be honest with you. I mean, I missed, um, I missed home. I, you know, I wasn't really ready to go to London and yeah. it was, I just kind of felt I had no other choice in a way. And uh, all my friends were having an amazing time in university. And, um, and I was basically with this older person, um, you know, she was at the end of her career, 65 years old, lovely lady, um, but kind of isolated, not really part, you know, not in a Is that where you're there. living at present or? Yeah, I mean, that's what I was living. So she, because you know, in London they would pay 25 pounds a week, you know, sort of, I don't know, what's that, $30 a week, you know, and, and today, you know, I mean, obviously, it's, it's probably about $200 a week here, you know, I mean, yeah. it, it, at this point, but it's, there was, it wasn't enough to live. And so I kind of had to kind of, she gave me that opportunity that I could support my, you know, or, or survive during that per process. But um, so, um, and then the other thing that I did, like you, is that because my dad said the same thing, because I said, how do you, you know, how do you learn about photography? And he said, it was the, the masters, just like you. And so, I would, I would also just go to the National Gallery and, you know, so I had very few friends. Um, London at that time wasn't quite so cosmopolitan. I mean, it's always yeah. been kind of cosmopolitan, but there was this whole kind of, you know, you're, you're a foreigner, you know, and so basically, you know, how long are you going to be here? And, you know, the, you know, so it was, it was, it was difficult. It was really tough. So I kind of put myself into my work and, you know, in a way it was kind of, kind of good because um it was really was it sort of the college years for you like going away and apprenticing and like this is really kind of you're getting yeah. more roots and, and feel for what it's really like to work in the industry and and not around your parents very much so yeah i mean it was it was a way of basically defining myself uh as a as a person i mean I, i'll never forget the kmart that i used to work with i came back one year um, and uh, the, the, the guy the, the guy I used to work for got a job at the photo hut and the photo hut was in the middle of the parking lot and I, I remember coming back after being in London for two years and seeing the same guy in this photo hut in the middle of the parking lot <laughs> I mean it might have been tough but look what I've experienced you know, in the last two years right so um, anyway yeah so it's it was uh, it was it was amazing I mean I, I wouldn't you know, not so what's the next transition point uh, from from London and and in your career? Where what happens next? You're there. You're you're working with people. And what what's the next stop? Are you already feeling like I need to get out of here? Are you kind of like trying to transition, or or, or does fate intervene and kind of throw something your way? Well, I mean, um, I you know what happens with London is that they they do this emergency tack, which is totally ridiculous, where they basically people that are so-called foreigners, even though I'm British, uh, they would take, you know, something like 15% additional tax. And you get this back after a, a year or so. Of, uh, and so I ended up with a sort of 
tax uh, windfall of a, you know a couple of thousand bucks you know and it was the it was the time of uh, you know you could travel you know living on ten dollars a day you know the yeah. book or whatever it was yep, so yep. I, I headed across Europe and I would sleep on the trains basically you know on the overnight and I got a an interrail or a Eurail pass and so and but what what that did is it allowed me to shoot and so um, and one of the things my dad always told me too is that as a photographer you've got to master the uh, first thing you do is master the, the decisive moment. Um, and you know the Cartier Bresson thing, and so mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of again, you know, this 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 kind of loneliness and being by yourself, you know, not knowing anybody, which I kind of lived through for the last couple of years, and then going, at, you know, it just allowed me to really focus on what was in front of the camera and really kind of be in tune with what was actually happening. And so I came up with this way of shooting uh, that you know those kind of decisive moment things in the sense of uh, I used to equate it with with music where I would sort of, you know, follow this, you know, the, with, with music would be da, 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 you know, and so you would yeah. kind of, and you would kind of take those instruments would be the people and what was happening around you. And you could sort of see when that kind of moment was going to happen kind of before. And so I started to do that. And, uh, and then I, then I was, and then my dad said to me, come back to Canada. And I, you know, and at that point, you know, uh, living basically on 25 pounds, uh, a week and and uh you know no money and uh you know i i i knew i couldn't be a photographer in london at that time i just knew i couldn't uh yeah. so he had a, had a studio and he said that he would help me and uh and so i i, I went back to canada um, at this point do you know uh what type of stuff you're interested in shooting kind of feeling it out i mean i i ended up getting a you know oddly enough i got a job in my Montreal uh, working as a catalog photographer and again I, you know when I first got back so it was kind of my first job as a photographer and uh, I hated it um, you know because at that, that time everything had to be shot I remember I didn't know how to use large format cameras and I took the job and I had a week to learn how to use large format cameras and then everything was shot to size to plate so they would emulsion strip the, the film you would shoot and and then basically that was the and then strip it together and, and uh so everything had to be shot exactly to the size of that how it was going to be printed and and you know the sort of uh but again it was again a great training you know, you know. Uh, when you were traveling what what camera are you using at that point in your career still a pentax still uh, the pentax okay still a pentax yeah still yeah. the pentax at that point um you know, so the old, my dad used to say, you know, take, take the meter reading at the back of your hand, you know, wherever you are and, uh, <laughs> you know, basically shoot that way. So I uh, got good at doing that. And, um, you know, but then I have one lens, a 28 mil lens, and, and that was kind of how I did it. But, uh, you know, but anyways, I, I came back to Canada and I, I, and then I ended up actually getting a full-time job. Is it, a, is it instantly like you feel like happy to be back? You're visiting friends, you're going out. Is that what's, what's the return? Well, I mean, to be really honest with you, I was disappointed. Uh, and I realized early on that uh, pretty well that my dad said he would help me, but you yeah. know, he really wanted me to just teach him what I'd learned in London and help wow. him and yeah, set yeah. the other way around. And, and so, he, you know, having said that, he did give, give me, get me this Federal Express job. Uh, so I did this big job really early on for FedEx uh, in Canada. And um, so I had these kind of early opportunities in that mm -hmm. respect. Um, which were which were great and uh, you know and I did a TD bank job and you know so, so I did these sort of pretty big jobs pretty well right out of the gate but um, but anyway so I did I, 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 then I worked as an assistant again I don't know I got yeah. caught up in that and so there was it, the relationship between you and your father and we haven't even talked what was your, what was your mother doing at this time was she she was his um, uh, producer I guess so, so she was it was a really family business it was family business yeah, yeah. And, I, and I you know even though they wanted me to be part of it I think um, they didn't mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I think uh, I was think it a difficult it, relationship between you and your parents or? yeah 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 definitely uh, yeah. And that's carried on. And my mother died recently, so that's yeah. sort of carried on until very recently. But yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, did I you never ever have the conversations, or it was just you know the difficulty was always there. Did you ever kind of sit down and, and address it, or? I just knew that if I, you know, I mean, get this. I get to the airport coming back from England, and my parents drive me to this Honda dealership and say, you know, we're going to get you a car and sign this lease. And I was just like, what? I've just been on a plane for seven hours. Why are you, you know, well, you're going to work for us and you're, you know, you're, you know, don't worry, it'll be your salary and you can have this car. And I said, nya, nya, nya. no, no, no. So I kind of knew, uh, I, I kind of figured it out 
that I really yeah. needed to do my own thing. And, and, uh, so at that point, uh, are you branching off to your, by yourself or, or? Yeah, I mean, I needed to make a living. So I ended up, uh, this photog- still life photographer actually gave me a job as his assistant. And I worked there for a year and a half. And um, I became his, again, his lighting guy. So when he, anytime there were people shoots, I would, and then he started to give me jobs. And I was supposed to be part of the, part of that system, his studio system. And uh, so so I started to do these uh, ads, you know, still life and food shots and things, yeah. but it, it, it was never really who I was, you know, yeah. it was never, never what I wanted to do really. I mean, I was always a people shooter and I, I remember the shoot that we did, you know, uh, Bill Cosby, you know, things like that, you know, where we would, he would, same sort of thing, you know, I would drive to Montreal with the assistants and the gear and light the whole thing. And he would come in at the last minute, you know, and take three frames of Cosby and then, you know, so it was, so I kind of knew I needed to do this on my own, and and um, and that's how I met my wife. Um, I started started to work with uh, at nighttime. He would initially allow me to use the equipment at nighttime in the studio. So I started to work for the equivalent of like Village on the Voice. It's called Now Magazine, and I started to shoot all their covers. Mm-hmm. And um, and I met my wife because we did this one cover of uh, punk punk. Uh, it was about punk in Toronto at the time. And uh, so his, the, the, the publisher's uh, babysitter was this person that was a punk. And so I photographed her and I, of course I took her anyway, anyways, I took her, I drove her home late at night and, and, and met my wife who was a, a roommate of hers, but. Oh, uh, is that right? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> was it instant walk in the flat or, you know, the, 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 the apartment and like, Ooh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> well, I just think, you know, we, we just had so much in common. I mean, yeah. she just recently lived in London and, and, uh, and then both of us were kind of wanted to travel and do stuff. And so we did that. Uh, a few months later, we went to India and traveled around and did, you know, did that stuff. And what business is she in? She's a set designer. Costume oh, designer, so. fabulous, fabulous. I think this is a good part, uh, our segue to jump into some of your photography. And we can talk about uh, your journey along the way as well. Okay, so this is, this is that European trip, um, the decisive moment time where so right. it was about basically... Uh, all these people would be characters or musical instruments in my mind at the time where I would, um, where I'd be following this person and the person over here and so on. And just, so yeah, so I did a whole series like this at this point. And this is on my. So growing up in a a photo family, uh, you you must've had a lot of influencers and known a lot of the greats. What are you kind of, who are you gravitating at this, at this point uh, in in your life and you know, who's made an an impact on you? Well, I think Bresson really was, was, uh, at that time was kind of, uh, I mean, certainly my dad, but I mean, my dad really said I shouldn't really focus on photography. He said it should be the, you know, the masters basically. And so yeah. at that point in time, I guess like you, I would break paintings down. I would study them and break them down into all the aesthetic different values and, and you know, the light and shape and, you know, all the different things that were happening in a painting. And, and I think that really helped me uh, articulate in my mind or separate things in my mind. And I think I've used that all the way through in the sense of, you know, what's important, what isn't important, you know, as a photographer always doing that, what's, you know, what stays and what goes out, you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, so I think, uh, so it was really more, I think, uh, painting, paintings. Right. Actually, it's funny for me, it was actually, I I fell in love and it was never photographers. It was cinematographers. I fell in love with, with cinema and, and the way they were lit and, that mood and the colors sound had a big part of that. When you're talking about sound, it's like, right. I, I usually talk about, you know, just put, put a song on your head and see how it changes the way you shoot it. It will, it, right. it changes, you know, you, you start shooting to a beat, you start thinking yeah. about a, a storyline, you start thinking of, you know, it becomes a, a, a film in your head and you start, right. you know, it's an incredible process and a good right. exercise. Yeah. So this was one of my first jobs. So this is William Burroughs. Uh, and this was shot for McLean's magazine. And, um, a typical Burroughs. I mean, not that I know <laughs> Burroughs at that point, but uh, you know, grumpy guy. So you're um, not really familiar with Burroughs and, and what, you know, who he is. No, at point. you're just shooting a, a portrait basically. I, I was sent there to do for McLean's. It was early on. I was kind of like, kind of like my dad was a stringer for time. I was sort of, I got in with McLean's and, and <laughs> uh, which is sort of the same thing. And, and they sort of said, go and shoot the beat. These do this, the beat movement or something. And, you know, I didn't really know. And, and, uh, So what we did is, uh, uh, you know, they sent me back to his dressing room and I kind of waited and waited and uh, event he wouldn't, he wasn't coming out. So I knocked on the door and he opened the door and what do you want? And and I just quickly went, (laughs) and that was it. He slammed the door. Right. (laughs) 
yeah, and I got that shot. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, I was, I was ready for it, but uh, it was kind of the, this abrupt uh, <laughs> moment, basically, which is kind but, of fun. I think that's kind of the, the nature of him, right? Which is yeah, uh, yeah. Kind of I, mean, I, I got to shoot uh, with President Clinton at one point, and I was so nervous. It was like the, in the first year or two of my you know, really becoming a professional photographer. And, you know, the gravity of just a president and Bill Clinton at that time and the gravitas right. he has when he walks in a room. And we were shooting at the 21 Club in New York City. And I'm setting up these lights, and, and I'm, I'm a nervous wreck that it's not going to happen. Like, this is the huge thing. And uh, he had leaned up against this wonderful wood kind of portrait on the wall. And I just saw him standing there kind of waiting for me, head down, and I just went, click. And then we shot a session. But that was the picture we ended up using was right. that you know, unplanned total shot right there. Um, so at, at this point, you're, you're, you're feeling a love for portrait photographer and people. What do you think kind of draws you to that energy and wanting to be a portrait photographer? Well, I think more of that in that time. I mean, I, I mean, certainly shooting, it was editorial. I mean, it yeah. was all, you know, I mean, editorial was basically the place to start. I mean, yeah. it was, um, and I think that's kind of those opportunities kind of define the course of your career, right? So, um, so this is now not editorial. And, and partly why I put in this is because most of my career, uh, I've made a living, uh, you know, doing a lot of things. But in my early career, uh, when I first came back, listening to Duffy, figuring out lights, what, what had happened was, is I went in an elevator and I noticed the, these grids that were on the, on the top of the elevator and how basically, even though the light source was very close to the top of the elevator, it was dark and then it would slowly, you know, fade down and you could see the light. And I realized it was the grid that was doing that. Nobody was using grids at that time. So oh, wow. I, yeah. So I found the manufacturer of the grids from the elevator and I basically I had to buy this industrial quantity. I remember, you know, like a thousand dollars of grids. I had these huge boxes of these grids for elevators because they're usually sold to buildings, right? And uh, so I, I took these grids, I cut them down and I painted them black and I, you know, clipped them on, you know, with clips under the, my lights. And what happened was is that I, I, I realized that I could then focus on um, industrial situations and then basically nobody was doing this at this time. And in the early 80s, when I was doing this stuff in annual reports, everything was about shooting basically the money that companies were investing in, in hardware and factories and machinery and stuff like that. And nobody knew how to light this machinery without showing the ugly pillar in behind or the <laughs> crap that was in the background, right? And so I was able to basically light these like a studio situation. And... Um, and, it, so, and so for the first five years of my career, I, my career, I was working nonstop during annual report season. I mean, I made more money then than I did pretty well throughout my, my whole career. I mean, it's That's my pretty, also pretty amazing that you're, you've, you've kind of discovered grids and now it's, it's a standard thing in people's kits you know, to, to use grids all the time to, to, right. to have that foresight and, and to be able to see light in a way and, and really kind of shape it in, in a way people hadn't thought of. Right. Yeah, I mean, I you know who knows whether or not I was the first or whatever. No, but it is, yeah, but, it's a, you know, but it was. It uh, certainly wasn't something you were running to your local camera store and buying at that point. So I mean, so this was very kind of typical. This was actually shot not that long ago in New York, mm -hmm. but it's uh, but it's very typical of the kind of style. Uh, and you know, I used to call it the the corporate smirk. And so uh, <laughs> and so I would do a lot of uh, corporate photography, and I was known for doing these big, large groups as well. These big group shots that other photographers had a hard time doing. But I, you know, it was how to get this corporate smirk, you know, it's like the approachable, you know, but still in control, the friendly, you know, all this sort of stuff. And so it was all about, you know, this, this way of working the energy uh, of the subject within a very short period of time to be able to control, you know, their energy to be able to capture these, these kinds of expressions. And that's really kind of was the main thing I, I found with this kind of work. And then in addition to that, of course, it's the lighting and the soft lighting and so on and so forth. But it was a style. And I think it still is a style. It still is an ability, but I'm just not quite as, a, you know, as drawn to it, but I can do it sort of, I mean, it's sort of similar kinds of things. I mean, this is, a, you know, how to create, these people are actors, they never met each other, you know, and so how do you get people you know, very quickly when you've got a massive shot list together and a crew and, you know, on set and to be able to make this happen. And that's kind of... Uh, and how did, that, how did you figure that out? It was, it, you know, it, was it back to your theater days of trying to kind of work with people? Do you think that had a big influence on, on how you work with uh, your, your subjects? Yeah, I mean, I would treat them as actors and then I'd give them a backstory. I would tell them, you know... 
you but know, you do that with people that I, aren't I would actors. say, you know, tell, tell <laughs> this person about your first love, your first yeah. kiss or something, you know. Are you I doing would, that with, with normal people and, and corporate people? Or are you doing the same kind of thing of trying to give them a, a story or something to think about other than just, hey, smile? Or how are you kind of, how are you finessing those, those, those moments? Well, you know, the thing is, is that uh, with, with the corporate thing, is, uh, there's a very limited time. I and mean, if you yeah. have, uh, you know, three minutes, you never know if you have, you know, one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes. And so you kind of got to go there real quick. I mean, it's yeah. different when you're paying up an actor, a model, a model, whatever it is, and you know you've got them for an hour, two hours, or whatever it is, and they're working for you really ultimately. So um, it's interesting you say that because I remember this first, this one shoot I was doing, and it was, this, it was for a magazine, and it was a cover shoot. And... Uh, and I, and I, I, I would just, I mean, I always thought that it, how I was, was reflected. Like they, they were looking at me. And so how my energy and who I was and how, you know, how I was kind of reflected back at them. And I remember this one time, which was photographing at the, the, the Scotia Bank, which is a Canadian, one of the big five banks. And, and it was in their head office in Toronto and it was in their main branch. And, and, and basically it was this, this CEO of this bank and everybody, this guy's like God, you know, corporate gods, right? And so all his employees were coming around and the big customers are coming around because it's the main branch and, and they're all behind me. And this guy's getting really uptight because, you know, I, my dad and I used to do this thing where we, you know, we kind of wink it, you know, and we do this body language thing and we, you know, we do, we were kind of, you know, we were, and, um, and it wasn't working. And I remember walking up to this guy in front of all, all these people, all this, you know, and I basically gave this guy a big bear hug. And I just held on to him until he relaxed. And then I said, okay, good, good. And then I walked back and then we had that connection. And he had no, he realized there was no, you know, the, and it was just that, you know, as a photographer, I think we really need to kind of, there's always that uncomfortable kind of space between our subjects. And we just have to basically kind of get rid of that space, <laughs> whatever, whatever it takes. And, and I think, and make that connection. And, Did you and have a moment do you, that, that kind of clicked with you? Or was it because you grew up in photography that you always, it, it sort of was an un, unthought of development that kind of just, happened because of living with photography you were already seeing and speaking that language because for me like when i when i first started shooting headshots or, or corporate shots or commercial shots trying to explain someone you know it, photography is definitely a language and right. if that person doesn't speak the language they're not an actor or, or someone that's comfortable in the camera trying right. to explain how a camera now takes a three-dimensional three image, flattens it, how you're trying to s s explain how the camera sees people, how light falls on people. Right. And to do that quickly, a lot of times what I would do, and I, I had to figure out because at first I was terrible at it, I would give them the camera and then I would step in front and I would pretend to be them. I'd say, you, you're the photographer now. This is what you're going to do. And then I'd, right. I'd take the camera back and suddenly like, oh, okay, this is what we're doing. What, right. For you, was it uh, uh, something that you kind of, developed very early on that you didn't realize or was there a moment that kind of clicked like I understand this language a lot better and it's making sense now well I, I mean I in the summertime when I was a kid I would go out as a bored teenager and I would you know I would take we lived in the suburbs and I would take the you know the bus or the train in and I would walk around with a camera and, I, and then part of that whole experience was to get over that uncomfortable thing where you're taking pictures of people and so I remember sort of, you know, that was what I needed to do at that time. And I guess from that point, there's always been that. Um, but, you know, I think it's just about your humanity and, and, and connecting with people. And, and I don't know. I just think that's part of what being a photographer is all about. Um, yeah. So this, this was, um, this, this, I, you know, I, so, so there's a few sectors that I've worked in, uh, predominantly Canada, and I still do. Uh, and one of them was education. So I worked in healthcare, education, corporate, uh, editorial, and obviously some advertising. But what I did is I came out with a style of light. And, and so lighting is always very, very, very key for me. And so what I would do is I would take in, either I would go in and I would pre-light the classroom. Uh, so when there was a break, and I would basically completely pre-light, and I would have a very clear direction I could shoot. And a quick direction How I much light are you working with at this point? Are you trying to keep it simple? Or are you working with a lot of light what, what like what's in your oh, kid on, i mean on this, I think in, in this particular shot i'm not working with a lot of light so the other but I, but so there were two ways either i would just build a whole wall of light down both sides and i'd do a ratio thing so i could shoot and have that nice soft light the other the other way i would do it is i would go in with um 
two assistants and plus the client and we'd have three different light sources and then we basically basically move as i move they would move and and we'd work out our ratios and so we'd have our back kick you know sun and we'd have our you know our source from the front and then a fill from further back and then we so so what it, the reason for that was is that i wanted to combine real situations but a higher production value yeah. so i wanted to have a sense of and, and, and again, so it's about how to, how to bring lighting and production values into, into, into photography, into those situations that kind of elevate, you know, the, the results of, of what that situation for the client was. And so it, what it did is it allowed me to capture real moments. And, you know, so I would do it in hospitals. I would go in basically and I would, fo you know, I would photograph, I would again, light on the fly, but with good quality lighting, with a real sense yeah. of quality of light. And I would be able to capture real you know, I used to call it lit reportage, basically. So it's kind of combining where I started from in the sense of the decisive moment, the kind of in camera, you know, gut of when the picture was, but I would also then bring in all the other stuff, which is the lighting, which, which again- Are you mainly a one man show at this or are you having a, 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 a no. small group of assistants or anything you work with? And I usually would get the client to have two assistants mm -hmm. and, and then I would, uh, you know, uh, get the client to also, I'd like, like working with three lights if I can. Um, yeah. Well, that's kind of like a minimum and um but yeah um and then and this is the same sort of thing and so this was margaret atwood and she's used this picture for the last five years as being her <laughs> only picture because it, it at least the one that she puts out and 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 the reason for that is because um again it's the connection you know and it's kind of fun you know this this is a story behind this picture where um it was shot for the guardian in london and uh it was um you know, uh, she was 45 minutes late. I told, I was told that I have an hour and I needed to do two different setups with her. And, uh, she turns up, you know, 15 minutes before the end of the set session. And, uh, what happened was, is, uh, she came and she, she arrived at this hotel. She wanted to go and change. And I just, instead of freaking out, I said, take your time, whatever, you know? And, uh, anyway, she, she, she kind of weighed me up, you know, and, uh, I had my daughter with me, which is also a good thing. And, uh, and so, she, she came down, she spent, we spent five hours together. We went all, we went on a hike, you know, oh, wow. we, 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 got, we did, and we, and so, you know, it was that ability to have, I mean, her giving me that time and that trust and stuff like that, that yeah. just ended up having, you know, because yeah. ultimately it's about the picture, but it's also about the relationship and it's about just being chilled and connecting with somebody. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's funny you, know, you talk about like, you know, a bartender has to uh, kind of quickly identify and talk to his customer and, and uh, understand them and make a connection quickly. But uh, photography is, is that same type of thing. You, it, if you're shooting people, you know, right. you really need to quickly. And sometimes, like you said, you only have a couple seconds or minutes to shoot with someone. And how do you quickly kind of break the ice or, or make them feel comfortable or, or, or get an emotion out of them? If you have a, a couple moments, if you have time, then it's a different story, but, and it's a different route that you'll take to get there. But uh, right. yeah, it's uh, so if you, what's the main difference if you have maybe, you know, you know, you only have five minutes with someone. How are you, how is that different than someone it, knowing that you have a couple hours with someone? Well, I mean, for me, it's always about planning and having a really clear yeah. idea about exactly what I want to do and, and if I can have the set of time to do it. And so I want to be absolutely ready to go with a very clear plan about what I do. So it's just from one to the next to the next to the next. I mean, it just really isn't time. But then suddenly when, when there's more time, you can experiment, you know, and you can sort of, you know, you can play and you can expand yeah. on it and you can get them involved in that process as well right so um but you got it for me it's all about planning it's always always about pre-visualization having a very clear understanding about what i want to shoot how i'm going to shoot it shoot it because you just you know you've got to have all your energy focused on that relationship and that connection and kind of managing the, the energy between you really and so, you can't so talking really about planning of, this is a, a good way to segue into this picture yeah so this was this was again a series of pictures and it's interesting because i've been doing all this corporate shoot and then in, in the early 90s uh, that whole annual report thing ended and uh and what happened was i went to see this uh photo editor who was still one of the top photo editors in canada claire uh, vandermeesh and uh and i went and I had all these portraits of executives and i thought it's a business magazine so it's it's a national newspaper and uh they had a, a monthly magazine a very slick magazine called report on business and so i went in and um and i went in and i and I, I showed her my work and she 
And she didn't respond. And I said, well, like, what's, why, why don't, you know, why aren't you responding? I said, this is all business people. And she says, well, it, you know, we're really looking for the, a new aesthetic. And I, and I said, I said, okay, what the hell is, you know, what, I mean, I kind of knew what aesthetic was, but what, what do you mean exactly? And she says, well, you, you need to show us, like, this has to be something you need to come to with up to us about. And so I was photographing for another magazine with my daughter. And I have to give my set, my daughter the credit of this. And it was, uh, it was, uh, again, another bank CEO and I did the shoot and she was in college at the time. And I, and I, so I did my shoot, she was my assistant. And I said, okay, we've got five minutes left based on your time. Do you mind if my daughter, takes a portrait of you because she's learning to be a photographer and they had no problem so my daughter always has to do it different like me she always has to be different than me which is fine and so she took she took this uh, the ceo of this bank and she said well do you mind you know this closet if you can go in the closet and can and and duffy said that to me too he says you can get people to do anything you want you just have to do it in steps so she says you know i really like your tie but it's creating a shadow on your face you mind if i just tie it up here right and I really want you to, to relax, bring your shoulders down, right? And then I just, I just, you know, can you just put your head to the side and I just open your mouth and close your eyes. And, and he did this, she got a shot of him hanging himself in his closet. And within like two or three minutes of this, this and I suddenly thought, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so when the, the student so when has I, become the teacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she was. And it just, it just blew me away because I had been photographing these executives as gods and I would just yeah. never think about asking them to do anything that was in a, you know, like that was crossing that, that, that boundary or that, you know, that, that respect. And so not that she did anything with the picture, but it was, uh, it showed me something. And, um, and so what I did is I went back to that photo editor and I said, look, I, I, have, a, I have an idea for you and, 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 and let me do this one shot. What we're going to do is we're going to get these executives. I'm going to have them do things. I'm going to have them act out what they do. And so if they're, in this case, he was a, a real estate investor. So she gave me a column. So for seven years, I had a double page spread in this magazine and I would do, it was called Smart Money. And I would do these shots of executives and we would come up with concepts every month about that, that would illustrate the kinds of things they invest in. So he, in this case, he was, uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, he, his investment uh, portfolio was all about um, uh, residential real estate. So we would just come up with these crazy ideas. You know, we lick people on fire, we <laughs> energy, we, we, you know, we had the gold uh, manager spray painting themselves gold, like gold finger, you know, I mean, we, we would do, we would, we would do, we, so because my daughter showed me this, I thought we can do anything. <laughs> you know, so at this point, I mean, this is, you're not doing composites, right? You're doing everything no, none of these practical are and, and, and in a day and age from now where you can kind of do anything you want on a green screen. You're actually coming in there. So what is a production like this? Uh, how, you're laying the grass. How does this come about? Well, I mean, we would, what happened was initially there was resistance, obviously, um, <laughs> you know, the, but what happened was it soon became uh, where, where there was a critical mass that basically these executives, these, these, you know, they would, they would want to do one option, you know, well, you so-and-so did this, what are you going to get me to do? Right. And so they were suddenly became much more open to it. And then, you know, we would pitch. After they first see ideas. it and the first person grabs on and suddenly that's like, I have to do that. I have to do this. Yeah. I have to, you know, I have to be part of this. And so uh, it became a lot easier as time went on. And, and, um, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, but we would literally, we, I got a thousand dollar fee and a thousand dollar budget. Basically that's what it was. And so I would keep to the thousand dollar budget and I, you know, we would like, you know, get, get a uh, you know sod and you know we would just physically do whatever we needed to do you know make it happen so, so when you, you know, show that they already know the idea once you're coming in and uh, you set it up and uh, do they kind of walk into the room and go wow and then you kind of work with them like what was the, the kind of unveiling uh, on the shoot for them or the process well you know they we would we would we would tell them i mean obviously you can't walk i mean it was really fun with this shoot because we literally had this bear and we, we put it into the regular uh el people elevator and and people and the doors would open on these floors and <laughs> the doors would open and it's just like bear you know <laughs> you know so um but you know the, to make all this work they had to participate and so it was a matter you know they, they knew what we were doing and then it was a matter of basically directing them to yeah. to, to play the role or to and it, it was fun it was just it was uh, a lot it's, of fun. it's it's fabulous it really is and, and i would have to say this is probably influenced by someone <laughs> 
Um, I know, I know you say Avedon, but I mean, the, the idea, I guess the idea of this, I and mean, not that I'd really seen Avedon's, I mean, yeah. obviously seen Avedon's work, but the, the idea with this is more about um, the, the idea about going to, and what I just decided, what I learned was, is that you could go to situations where you wanted to shoot something. Well, in this case, it was a bee fair. Uh, or fair where they would do this bee contest or whatever it is. And then, and, and then basically set up your lighting. So I would bring my lighting in my studio to wherever these situations were. And, 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 and I realized I could get way more powerful stuff that way by basically being where they were. And so again, it was about, you know, I was a location people, photographer, and I was always, and lighting was always important. I was always used to lurking on location. So I'm bringing my light. So I, it was easy for me to just go. And so this was literally, on the beside the stage where they'd walk down after winning the you know or, or going up to 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 compete or whatever it is and i would just say oh you know let me take a couple of shots and so um but it was because we had lighting and it, it, you know it became something better than it would have been lighting lighting's key <laughs> in my yeah case. yeah uh, absolutely and, uh, and at this point uh, what are you shooting on and uh, what kind of lights are you playing with uh, in, in your career um, you know, initially I was shooting with Dynalite and I, and I, and I struggled with Dynalite and yeah. I, and I, you know, and it's because the reflectors, you, you know, there was no, there was grids, but there was no way of really light shaping. And, and so this, this was another shoot that I did for Graph Diamonds in London. And it was kind of like a breakthrough shoot for me. Um, but, um, uh, and then, and then uh, you know, th by this point I was shooting on a phase back and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But, but this was, I, I'd never f photographed beauty or fashion or anything else like that. And the reason was why- Was it something you always kind of wanted to shoot or just wasn't interested or what, what, what was kind of blocking you from doing it at this point or, or not having done it? Well, you know, it was, it was not where I was at. I mean, I was yeah. always wanted to bring kind of my photographic ability to something that was more real and more, uh, and what, not to say this isn't real, but it, it's, it's, uh, I was more interested in, in other things. And it, and I think, but the, the entree and it seems, to this it case, seems to me that this, this didn't really catch on to you and you didn't, weren't that interested in shooting in beauty. Is that true? Well, I mean, I didn't go on with it because it wasn't yeah. really, it, but it was a very successful campaign. And, and, and what, what, it, what happened was, is I shot it. Uh, the reason why I got the shoot is because, um, it was um, it was my lighting. So I went in and and they hired me because they saw my lighting and and they wanted something different and and it was I, I thought it was amazing that they would give me a shoot like this because it was top level advertising, yeah. worldwide campaign. Um, I mean the diamonds were like you know ten million pounds and all the rest of it and it was, but it was I had a I had an amazing time because. I, what I would do is every time we had to do a shot and we did a number of them over three or four days, I would strip out all the lights and I would say, okay, we're just going to do it different this time. We're going to try it differently. We're going to just, just start from scratch. And so it, for me, it was like this great lighting kind of challenge. And it was kind of like proving to them, you know, Hey, <laughs> you know, not only do you make the right decision, but yeah. I'm not playing by any of the rules that anybody else does because, you know, lighting, lighting, if you just know it and it's intuitive, it's there, you can just, you just do it, right? It's, it's, it, it, it's it kind of seems though that, I mean, obviously you had every tool it took to shoot beauty and fashion, but it seems that you just wanted to dive deeper into the details of people. And, and sometimes that feels like it's not beauty when it actually is what makes life beautiful. Is that something that kind of you were having a conversation like that in your head or? Well, you know, I mean, in, in this case, it was more, it was a good job for me because it was about lighting. But I mean, obviously the model, um, you know, she was this beautiful model, but she ate like crazy. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe it, you know, for some sort of slim. Um, but, you know, the, the, the people of that world weren't that interesting to me. And I, and I guess uh, I, I've always connected with this, you know, human condition, you know, you know, the kind of struggles that we have as people, as human beings and that kind of a, I want to go deeper. And, and so, um, so th this was a shoot that was interesting because I was, uh, and it was, there's been certain things that have happened in my career that have pushed me and, and really kind of been breakthrough things for me. And so this was, this was a shoot that I did personal shoot. And, um, and what it was is I was up for a job uh, uh, for an advertising shoot and I, uh, and they didn't tell me that they wanted white backgrounds. They just so and for me, the white backgrounds like how simple, how basic is a white background, you know, two lights on the background, maybe a boom over above, you know, flight in the front, fill in there, you know, it's like, so basic. And so I didn't think I needed to show that I wanted to show what I could really do. And so and I phoned them up after say, well, you didn't get the shoot because you didn't show any white background shots. And I said, really? really, really, really needed to see that, you know? And I said, well, I'm going to show you 
the most difficult white background shoot ever. And I'm going to prove to you that I can shoot white backgrounds. And so I decided that I would go to this region. And so part of what my, what, what my underlying kind of things that I was working with personally that I really wanted to do because of living in Canada and First Nations and wanting to document um, you know, indigenous tribes and sort of our past, our connection to who we are as human beings. I wanted to go to this region in Ethiopia, Oma Valley, where these tribes still existed and, and kind of maintained the same lifestyle, part of the Rift Valley, which again connected to our, some of the oldest human beings and so on and so forth. So I went to this region and then, you know, this was a, a war, a tribal war zone. So basically the government wasn't part of it. Uh, it would stay away from this area and uh, seven days drive in, you know, battery packs, having to charge them in the car, um, you know, unbelievable. And, uh, you know, we would set up these, we would drive into a village with a white bed sheet, pin it to the side of the truck. Within 10 minutes, we'd have to get the hell out because there were, you know, other tribes would find out and, you know, there would be people running towards us. And so we would like some, you know, we'd have to open the door and just throw all the gear into the car and draw, you know, so it was, it was, but fabulous. So there was, there's a next shot, which is uh, uh, kind of illustrates the issues surrounding. So this was a poacher and I, uh, and I didn't know it was a poacher. So with my guide, I would say to, I would say to my guide, if like, if, if, as soon as you hear, because he understands the languages of the area. And I say, as soon as you hear of any, any issue, any problems, and we have to go, you just tell me and we're gone. Like, and so we would do, he would do that. But in this case, he was really insistent that we had to go right now. And it turns out that this guy was a poacher and it was a, we had come across a bunch of poachers that were under, you know, in this one area and they were like pirates. They, they looked completely different than the reg regular tribal people. And they were probably from another area. Turns out that they had been in a firefight with the government and had killed uh, a ranger a couple of days before. And we left and oh, about wow. a mile up the road, we ran into a truckload of soldiers that were looking for these guys, you know? So if we had hung around any length of time, so we would have been dead. We would have been in the firefight, but the, um, what really pissed me off about this, uh, as I went back to Toronto and I showed, there was this one magazine I really wanted to work for and I got into this photo writer and I showed her these pictures and she was standing in front of me. She said, well, I don't know if the right, this is the right context, you know, these pictures against the white. I, you know, I really feel that you should have included the, you know, more of an environmental, which I, of course I did, but, and I, and I looked at her and I basically <laughs> said to her, I said, you don't realize I almost got killed taking this picture. And, you know, we as photographers put ourselves in these massive risks so that we can sit in front of you and try and impress you and show you that we have these capabilities. You know, you have no was idea. This, <laughs> was this sort of the first time you felt like maybe I'm in over my head and this, I might get out of this one? Have you had other experiences like that? Or was this sort of like that... I've had a, I've had a few I've had a num I've had a few of them I've had a number of them so, touch wood so far um, I've, uh, but yeah I mean this is one of the few times I mean you're playing on the edge for these situations right because you're you're going where other people aren't going you're 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 taking pictures but because of that the fact that you're kind of have this in a way kind of you know boldness <laughs> or whatever it is they respond to it right but um, but yeah, no, I, I was in, uh, in Bolivia, uh, you know, had a bus crash off the side of, you know, rolling oh. down, you know, and, uh, you know, I've had uh, in military coups. I mean, I've had a number of different scenarios uh, that I've been involved in but so far. Luckily, I, I've been okay. Um, so I went back a couple of years later and shot black backgrounds instead of white backgrounds, but anyways. And, and then this was also uh, an image that was part of a photo annual, one photo mm -hmm. award. Um, and... Um, but, you know, the, the thing about Africa, and I remember I was shooting in Papua New Guinea once and I was photographing this, it's not an image that's here. And I, and I had this picture of a boy with a, with a holding a, a young crocodile. And, it, and, this, the, and, and somebody said to me, you know, how could you take a picture of somebody, you know, animal rights, you know, how did, you know, and the thing is that you have to understand the context of where these pictures are taken. You have to understand that, that, that you know, the picture that we just saw, this is, a, this is a village where they have cows, which is their livelihood, where basically the following village, which is at war with them, sends in groups of men with machine guns and takes and kills and takes the cows and basically wants to take their livelihood away from that village. So, they're, right. so you know, and, and they do this to each other. And so while the men are out following, fighting, um, they leave the older men and the younger kids effectively to defend the village. And so this is, this is just what that is, the older men and the younger. Uh, it's the younger. just a, a real journalistic photo. It's real. 
<laughs> other than, of course, I'm lighting it. Other than light, it's, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's real. It's 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 real. And so, you know, you, you go into these situations and, and um, you can't apply the same rules, you know, or the same sensitivities potentially as we would, you know, because it is what it is. And I, and I, I, I you know, and I think it's, uh, I think it's, I think we should photograph something that's there. And I did, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, and, and this one with the light and, and obviously it's, a, you know, it's so very this, was a photo. this is Ebola. Uh, so I was sent to uh, Liberia. Now, when I say, you know, Ebola, it is Ebola, but it was predominantly, it was very much at the end of a, the Ebola epidemic. And I was there with, uh, the U S head immunologist or whatever it is. And they were on a mission. And so I was there with them, but I was shooting for, so it was about basically it was for wired UK and it was about how, um, you know, uh, more people survived that Ebola outbreak than previously. And so they wanted to do studies on, on why did, why did so many people survive? And so immunology and so on, whatever it is. So, um, but so I wanted to kind of, um, you know, the, the thing is, that it, as I always said, I try and pre-visualize. So I had pre-visualized in my mind that opening shot. And so when I went to, to uh, I don't remember the name of the city, but the name, main town there in Liberia, um, you know, the, the Ebola thing had passed. And, and the graveyards were basically where they buried all these, uh, um, all the dead were outside in the countryside. And so I found out where this was. And I, I remember going to try and get permission to shoot. And so basically this was his family had lost, he had lost a number of his family and these were fresh grapes. So I just knew that this would basically be the yeah. image, but you know, sometimes you have these ideas and then it's, how do you, how do you execute this? You know, how do you get access after the fact, you know? Um, and, and, you know, so you, you figure out how to tell a story. And then the other thing I did with this particular shoot is I decided that we were set up in the clinic again with this lovely light, but we would shoot, uh, as many survivors as we possibly could. And so I think we shot like 200 survivors and we did the so, so a question here, having gone into a, a country that had dealt with something uh, uh, like Ebola and now seeing, you know, the States and us dealing with COVID and this pandemic, um, what correlations and what differences and what, what, what are you seeing having seen both of these? Like, how are we handling it? Or how is it, is it, is this slightly becoming a little scarier than something even Ebola was, which was terrifying, but uh, uh, what is it, how are you viewing this in the, with having those experiences? Well, I mean, one of the, the one of the issues was, of course, it was uh, community spread and for Ebola and the way that people lived. And uh, the other issue, which I'm, I, I think we're starting to get into, and I think that in, in the States and around the world is the, is the overrun of hospitals. And, you know, the problem uh, with Africa, of course, is that, um, most of these hospitals are reserved for people with money and, and unless you have that cash and the money, which is yeah. just not really possible for most people. Uh, so a lot of these people were showing up at the hospitals and weren't, weren't being admitted. And so there was a, and essentially that's what the death was. And so, but in addition to that, of course, we saw those images where they would take them to those sort of isolation areas, but that was really more for the purpose of isolating them from the rest of the community, not necessarily to, to, to make sure they got well and better and so on and so forth. So, um, I think it's just the, 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 the scale of, of what potentially could happen. Here. And I think we're starting, yeah. we're starting to see it, you know, and I, and I know that, you know, in the UK, uh, at the height of what was going on there, you know, I have, uh, I've heard that, you know, people were admitted and people died, of, you know, so there's a lot of deaths that were happening because they yeah. couldn't get access to healthcare. And I think, I don't know what it is in the States, but I get a sense of that. Unfortunately, a lot of the hospitals, especially, you know, like the California and Texas and, and Carolina and stuff like that are now at, you know, at a hundred percent capacity. And, and you know, yeah, it's getting, it's, it's getting, uh, kind of you, know, you know, it was really kind of amazing. And in a, in a way I kind of, I was with the chief immunologist, one of the chief immunologists in the States. And so I had really clear uh, advice on whether or not I could touch people, whether or not I could get close to them whether or not, you know, what the, what the real risks were. And because, so kind of like parachuting into this and not having lived through all of this, I didn't have the same fears that we're having now, you know, yeah. we, you know, we're living in this time where, you know, uh, Oh, you know, this person's not wearing a mask or, you know, and, and, you know, or what, you know, so we're afraid of people, we're afraid of going out. And so it's that fear of basically living in our lives. And so, I found that what I did, which was just amazing, was when I photographed people in, in that time, I, I, I held their hand. I put my arm around them. I came physically close. And of course, I knew that I could do that safely with these individuals. They, right. they had been cleared of the disease and so on. But everybody was still in that fear mode. And so that warmth and that human connection was just 
unbelievable that you know, because yeah, they it, it totally so totally changed the dynamic of everything i'm sure right and the energy the energy that you just shared in that um so let's go into this portrait here now we're going to get kind of more dive i think a little deeper into your portrait work right so this was this was another shoot for wired so wired in the last i don't know 10 years or so um, the last shoot i did for them was last year in kenya but um they would send me they call me the danger guy so they would i mean they would send me on shoots that basically other people maybe wouldn't do or they just knew that <laughs> i would come back with images like i you know and i would come back with the, the and were you like, were you happy with that i mean do you love and enjoy the travel is it is it something that you wanted or is it just so, you know something i'm good at and i'll accept the job or for you what was I, it i just love working with wired and i love yeah. the i love the i love the quality because the the production values and the it was totally where i was at as far as you know the lighting and the kind of quality that they produce and the kind of just the high level of design and everything just worked really well but um I, I, I like, I mean, I'm, I'm a sucker for travel. I mean, I'm just a total sucker for travel. <laughs> I just, I, you know, and I love going to parts of the world like that where, you know, you get these experiences that, you know, other people wouldn't get. I mean, in that case, we, we went, you know, that shot that you just showed, he's a poacher as well. And uh, we went on a night patrol with the Kenyan Wildlife Service, you know, at night and, you know, across the border into ten Tanzania, you know, we're not supposed to do. And, you know, in the pursuit of poachers and, you know, it was like it's military. I mean, it was just like, um, unbelievable you know uh, and i was just thinking and my wife said you know before i went you make sure you don't do that you know it's like oh you know but you're, <laughs> this is, you know this is so amazing right and uh so this this was a this this was a poacher and it was just this idea that he was a reform poacher and now he's working as a ranger and so of course oh, we're not wow. going to photograph a real poacher but uh but it was you know it was it was about photographing that kind of uh, I wanted to capture that kind of uh, that, that ability to kill, you know, and that, that kind of uh, killer instinct and, and that kind of this energy, you know. And are, are they very receptive to having their photos taken or did you get to spend time with them or they're just like sort of like, I don't know, really understand this and take the picture and get done with it. What was the kind of dynamic on, on some of this? Well, you, you know, you're in the circumstance. I mean, you have to still remember that you're still very much in, in that environment and what's really going on. And that's kind of the benefit of, of what, why it's so amazing to do those sorts of things because you're you know it's there <laughs> you know? and and uh it, it, you know most of it's done for you really um <laughs> you know and it's just you have to be you know what it is it's willing to face it and confront it it's not being afraid it's it's basically responding to this person and basically not being afraid you know and you know the funny thing is is i'm generally a big chicken shit you know i mean i walk <laughs> on the, you know i walk down the streets in new york and i go oh, that's somebody other, you know, and, you know and, I, and i avoid conflict and all the rest of it but um yeah, do you but, go to these know, parts of the world where you know that anybody in, in like in new york city would probably not go <laughs> yeah. But it's the camera and the, the, you know, wanting so desperately to capture this. Do you feel and, secure behind that camera? Is it, there's a certain security that, a false security that you feel when you're behind it, do you feel? Well, it's not necessarily, it's, it's me, but it isn't totally me. You know, it, yeah. there's a purpose behind what we're doing. You know, I mean, I'm there for a magazine, you know, and we're trying to tell this story and it's not just about me, you know, so, yeah. you know, and, and then of course that goes beyond because of course you can be put into situations. Generally, I haven't, I haven't been where you question whether or not you should be doing that or photographing in that circumstance yeah. but so so part of part of what um i i i discovered a photographer called nadav kander and, and nadav and the way i discovered him is i was working in london and um i had this assistant who was my freelance assistant and every time i fly to london to do a shoot i'd always work with this guy and he was like this absolute pro assistant he worked with all the top people and he was mostly he 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 was used to working with photographers that didn't know what the hell they were doing, and so they they would they would hire him as their lighting guy. So they would get this job, and then he would basically light their shoots and basically produce their shoots. So he's used to doing that, and so I, I didn't need him to do that. I didn't want him to do that. So I would like fight with him, you know, and I would say like, <laughs> "No, I want to light this. It's my picture. You you know, stay away." But um, he had worked with Nadav Kander as his assistant, and so he had a real sort of understanding of what Kata, Nata kind of lighting principle was. And so, and, and, and one of the things that he told me was Nata lights for the shadow. He works only in the shadow. So when he's lighting, he's basically, he's not thinking about the highlight, where the light is. He's basically creating the shadow and then working that shadow and the tones, you know, there's so much more depth and, and 
So we were doing a shoot and we were really running out of time. And I just, I just gave it up and I said, okay, you light this. And he lit the shot and he lit it absolutely beautiful. And he lit it for the shadow. And I, it just like, okay, I get this now. And so, <laughs> I, I, all right, I go, well, there you go. And uh, so I, I, what I did was I, um, when I came back to Canada at that point, I started to, uh, I realized, and I started to photograph my neighbors. And I would do these shoots where I would, like my neighbor so he's a neighbor of mine and, and and i started to basically work with the shadow and so this was a kind of a breakthrough so this is a good friend of mine and, you know and it's that caravaggio light whatever it is and as you say they work he works with the shadows it's all been done before but you know you have to kind of be you have to kind of be it has to be pointed out to you and so and i really started so it was kind of a breakthrough for me and um but it was Again, a difficult thing to do because we, to the light with the shadow and to work with the shadow, it's all working with Phil. And to work with Phil, you have to work with multiple sources. And mm -hmm. you have to work with, and, and, and if you're going to light with shadow, shadow is created by very harsh light. And so it's, you can't really necessarily work with the shadow when you're working with soft light. So it's, it's very hard. It's multiple sources and it's blending subtly all those as a sort of a formula. And so what I find with all of that is that, and I've been continuing to do that is, you know, like the portrait you just saw with the, with the poacher, you know, all of these is, is part of part and parcel of that. But it, it's difficult because now I bring all this lighting, you know, and I've got this drag, all of this, but it's, you know, some people say, well, how did you like that? You know, what are the formula, whatever it is. And it's always different. 